Hey, good morning, everyone. So while we're waiting for everybody else to join, and I realize it's a minute or so early, there were a couple of things in the news, and I thought it would be worth bringing those up, particularly because they have to do with passive immunization and vaccinated uh, vaccination. So many of you heard that Pfizer's vaccine, which is an RNA-based vaccine, um, showed 90% efficacy. I think that's a little early to be calling it that efficacious because it's really based on a low number of people, <clears throat> but it's an RNA-based vaccine where you're just taking viral RNA and injecting into the muscle tissue of a vaccine. The other, and, and the, there's a related version of that by a company called Moderna that is basically the same RNA vaccine with the same gene and, and being injected. So that's active immunization. But there was also uh, the FDA approved passive immunization against coronavirus. And that was, that's where you're transferring antibodies against the virus into sick patients to try and, and neutralize it. So now you can discuss that at Thanksgiving with family and friends <laughs> and we'll move on. Okay, so the bonus question last time was, if you have a virus that infects a tree, do you expect it to have a large genome or a small genome? And there's no right answer to this. I just want you to, to uh, answer this and justify it based on, well, what would the virus need to carry with it? And so there's, there's two ways you could approach this problem, right? Plants don't typically move. And so plant viruses need to persist in one individual plant longer than, for example, humans that interact with each other. So if it's going to be something that needs to persist longer, that typically suggests you need a larger genome to regulate um, gene expression. You know, plants do have an innate immune system they can make antiviral things, so you would have to evade those. But that the other side of that is that trees mainly have innate immune, immunity, so they don't have MHC proteins, they don't have T cells and B cells, so you don't have this problem of having to evade the adaptive immune system, which is a big part of, of um, many viral life cycles. And so you need far fewer genes than something that typically infects humans. So that would suggest you need a smaller genome. Um, in reality, most plant viruses are typically small RNA-based viruses with very few genes. They really can just get in and infect and, and evade whatever immune mechanisms are thrown at them. But there are some exceptions of larger plant, um, plant-specific DNA viruses that are able to sort of evade and, and survive for longer. So again, there was no really one right answer here. I'm just trying to get you to think about how a virus might survive. Okay, so, so far we've covered immune responses to foreign things that you do want. You want immune responses to vaccines so you can be protected. And you do want immune responses to infections so that you can control infections and go on to live your life. Now we're going to start talking about other things, other types of immune responses that you may or may not want. And the first one we're gonna talk about is autoimmunity. Autoimmunity sort of is the reverse of those two. It's a immune response that you do not want to self antigens or you know, non-foreign things. And it really, the, the concept of autoimmunity, it goes all the way back to the early 1900s with Paul Ehrlich. And what he showed is that if you took red blood cells from a goat and you inject it into other goats, which are outbred, they're, so they're you know, genetically different, you could generate antibodies to those red blood cells. But if you injected the same red blood cells back into the, the original goat, it would not generate antibodies to those. And so this was the idea of tolerance to self antigens. And it's often misthought mis that Ehrlich was, was suggested that autoimmunity or what he called horror autotoxicus was a reality. In fact, he was very much against that. He, he thought that that was just not following the rules of, of uh, the immune system. We now know that autoimmunity happens quite a bit, right? And this is because we, if we think about it, you, 
we've already talked about some of the cardinal properties of the immune system. And one of those is the discrimination between self and non-self, right? Your, our innate receptors are designed to recognize foreign structures. And so if you don't have those, you can't really start the innate system. On the other hand, you have central tolerance where well, self-reactive B cells are deleted in the bone marrow and self-reactive T cells are deleted in the thymus. This is the process of negative selection. But unfortunately, those rules are very context specific. So you do have what are called damage associated molecular pattern receptors. And these recognize self structures. And so you can engage the innate system but if you have enough self damage. And then negative selection for B cells and T cells is not complete. So some escape from the bone marrow and thymus. So these, these processes are not 100% efficient and you do have some self-reactive cells escape. And so we have to, we normally rely on mechanisms of peripheral tolerance. And that's where we start our discussion today of what is peripheral tolerance and, and tie that to central tolerance. And then how is it maintained? <clears throat> so autoimmunity by definition is a, an immune response to self, okay? And it can be mediated by T cells and or antibodies, and it results in damage, okay? So a lot of the uh, autoimmunity we see is just tissue damage that ultimately results in loss of function of an organ or, or system. And, and this is really the consequence of a dysregulated adaptive immune system. There are a few autoimmune disorders that are just, are mainly just innate mechanisms, but by and large, most autoimmune um, diseases are a consequences of the adaptive immune system. So we talked about autoimmunity. There's always a start to it. There's an inductive phase, and we'll talk about what, what those potentially are. And during that inductive phase, then there has to be some inflammation. There has to be some signal to the innate system that yes, you should, should make a response to this. And then as that progresses, <clears throat> there is a, a continuing late phase, which is the largest part of that time, where you have irreversible tissue damage, okay? Where you just, you're damaging tissues that can't be repaired fast enough for, your, for you to survive. <clears throat> so let's start first with a discussion of tolerance, right? And tolerance is to self antigens. And some of the early experiments showed that if you were to take, if you were to take T cells and B cells very early in life from a neonatal mouse, so less than three days old, and you transfer those into a different strain of mice. Here, LAC6 mice putting the cells into a the CBA strain of mice, that you then let that mouse grow up and later in life, it will accept a skin graft from this unrelated strain of black six mice, meaning the cells that you transferred made that mouse tolerant to a, a later skin graft. However, if you took a uh, skin graft from a different strain, here Balb C mice, they would still reject it. So they had still reactive cells that, that could react to skin but they're actively tolerized um, early in life. The analogy to this is uh, one of the reasons that, that some people think we have high numbers of peanut allergies is that in the 80s and up until the 90s, doctors were advising people not to give their, their young children peanut butter because the idea was that they didn't want them to develop allergies, but in, in reality, your exposure to peanuts at that very early age in life would actually tolerate you to it so you didn't develop allergies. So that's just an aside. It may or may not be true, but that's what, um, what these experiments were based on. So the first thing is, is if we consider tolerance, right? The first part of tolerance, in this case for B cells, is central tolerance, where you have a developing immature B cell, right, in the bone marrow, and it's going to have its B cell receptor that will try and bind antigen. And if it does, then it gets, it will undergo editing 
of its B cell receptor, it can be deleted or, or undergo energy, okay? But the problem with this is that most um, tissue specific antigens are not being expressed in the bone marrow. Primarily what's being recognized by B cell, developing B cells in the bone marrow are serum antigens, things that are either present inherently in the bone marrow or are brought in uh, in the blood. And so you have um, antigens that, that are presenting things either by binding to FC receptors, to complement receptors. Here's, there's, there's two different complement receptors. And they're holding things for B cells to recognize. Now, because of that, you don't delete, for example, pancreatic cell specific B cells because they're not seeing pancreas in the bone marrow. And so if you, if you have somebody who, who has mutations in these receptors, they also have a problem with autoimmunity. And particularly any of the complement receptors will have a strong predisposition to autoimmune diseases. So if we have all of these B cells that are reactive for self antigens and they make it out of the bone marrow, you have to have other mechanisms that can shut them down, okay? And because of that, that's where we have peripheral tolerance. Now, one of the things that happens to these B cells is that they undergo a process of energy. And we've, we've had this, this term before. This is the inability to respond to antigen, right? It's exactly the opposite of energy. Energy is you get to do something. Energy is you sit on the couch and watch TV. And so energy is, this, is the result of a strong B cell receptor cross-linking in the bone marrow, okay? And the, the ultimate form of energy is they eventually die. And so what happens is this is regulated by two things. For whenever you have a cell that you want to, to differentiate or you want to progress to the next checkpoint, it needs two things. It needs a, differential, a differentiation signal and a survival signal. So you need to tell it don't die, and, um, and this is what you should do. And so if you don't have a, a BCR signal, if it's weak or, or non-existent, then you will get upregulation of NF-kappa B proteins, and then that then leads to expression of a protein called BCL2. This is a mitochondrial associated protein. It's the main pro-survival protein or main survival signal in a B cell. If there is strong BCR signaling, then those cells will actually block the expression of BCL2 by two proteins, BAD and BIM. Right? And those will prevent the cell from, it will, it will initially shut off its differentiation and then ultimately tells that cell you should probably die off. And so Chris Good now, looked at this and he started, he really was the first to show B cell energy. The way that he did this is he took mice that ha were transgenic for a B cell receptor that recognizes hen egg lysozyme, which just is egg protein, okay? <clears throat> so all of the B cells in this mouse have a B cell receptor that is already rearranged. It's, it's a transgene, so it doesn't under, they don't undergo somatic recombination. They just express this. All of those B cells recognize the Hennig lysozyme. And he bred those to mice that express Hennig lysozyme. Okay, so here's the antigen. And here is the BCR. So in the F1, they have both the antigen and the B, and the B cell receptor for that antigen. What he found is that if he then injected those mice with hen egg lysozyme, they don't make a response to it. You can't, and the B cells in that mouse were energic. They still developed, they still existed. So they're self-specific B cells, but they wouldn't respond to antigen anymore. And you could even transfer these into another mouse that did not express hen egg lysozyme and they're programmed not to respond. Okay, so that suggests there's a peripheral tolerance mechanism, meaning, yes, you, you don't delete every, all these B cells, but they're maintained in some uh, 
um, non-responsive state or what we call energy. And so in the central tolerance, you get clonal deletion mostly and receptor editing. So if it's a self-reactive B cell receptor, it can rearrange its light chain again, try to get another shot at, at being non-reactive. But then um, if it is strongly reactive, they'll get deleted. But these B cells that come out into the periphery have other mechanisms. And so they no longer can do receptor editing. And the main strategy that you have is just forcing them into this energy state or ultimately deleting self-reactive T cells or self-reactive B cells. Now the mechanisms of that happening are not fully understood. There are certainly we know some of the mechanisms, but there are both B cell intrinsic and B cell extrinsic mechanisms where B cells can either be deleting themselves or being deleted by other cells that recognize them. So if we go back to sort of how does what one of the ways that this is happening is that you can actually think that this happens all the time. You have a self-reactive B cell encounters a self antigen and then it and then it makes a little uh, primary foci response, okay? So normally our B cell would get activated in the, in the cortical region, then goes looking for T cell help. But if it does not get T cell help, it forms plasma blasts, right? In the, in the T cell zone. And those will make IgM, but they're short lived and they eventually just die off. It's only if you have CD4 help that you're able to get um, that CD40 signal that tells us those uh, B cells to go to the, the follicles and form a germinal center. Here's the dark zone. And they're where they're rapidly proliferating. They're mutating their B cell receptor isotype switching. They then go to the light zone or you select for the better ones. And many of these will die off, but from this, you get memory B cells and long lived plasma cells. So the simplest form of maintaining peripheral tolerance for B cells, is just there's no CD4 help. If you don't have a CD4 cell that recognizes this, an antigen from whatever that B cell is recognizing, you don't get a CD40 signal, so you get a short lived response. So even if you make some self antibodies, it's not that big a deal, it just goes away. It's only when you get the, the CD4 help that you have long lived antibody producing cells and memory B cells that then cause disease. Now from Chris Goodnow's experiments, we know that in fact, there's B cell intrinsic mechanisms where B cells will shut themselves off. And that's not on, on this slide. Okay, <clears throat> now for T, so because of that, because of this idea that the simplest way to control B cells is just to not have self-reactive T cells, which means that T cell tolerance is much more important or much more strictly regulated, right? So here's our thymus, our, T, our developing T cells come in. They are undergo positive selection on cortical thymic epithelial cells. That selects for things that can in fact recognize MHC. And then they undergo negative selection on the medullary epithelial cells. And that's where if they recognize self antigen on MHC, then, um, then they get deleted. Now, if you remember from T cell development, T cells don't really have receptor editing. It's much more strict rules for T cells. If they recognize self, they're just deleted because they're too dangerous. Okay. so. High affinity self-reactive T cells are deleted in the thymus. The other thing that's different is that in the thymus, you have this protein called AIR, and that turns on many or most self proteins. So you get uh, tissue specific antigens expressed in the thymus. Okay, that's different than B cells. B cells don't have the similar thing. So T cells have these additional layers of, first they have to recognize MHC, they have to not recognize self protein or self peptides on the MHC and you're turning on tissue specific antigens. And that works pretty well. Um, self reactive T cells are deleted in the thymus pretty efficiently, but there's a couple problems with that. 
first of all, you've got 20,000 proteins being expressed in a cell and you've only got 2,000 uh, 2, T cell receptors on a T cell, or sorry, I said that wrong. If you've got 20,000 proteins you've turned on in your medullary epithelial cells, and that cell is only expressing 2,000 MHC, then there's competition of epitopes for the MHC and, and TCR recognition. So, you know, if you don't have very many of those, you don't delete the T cells very well. And so on the right here is, is a, it's a little hard to understand. Um, but basically, if you had the more of that peptide that's on the surface, the better off you are at deleting them. Okay, so if you have lots of that peptide, you don't have to have very high TCR affinity to get deletion. And so you're really talking about in the T cell receptor, it has to recognize MHC well enough so that it can be po undergo positive selection. But then if there's a lot of peptides, it's competition for binding to MHC and so you don't get deletion. So all, the only cells, T cells that really get, make it out of the thymus are here in this orange band. They're, they have enough affinity for, M, for MHC that they can recognize things, but not so much for self antigen. So it's actually a pretty narrow slice of the, T, the potential T cells that make it out. That's seen a little bit in a different way here, right? Is that if you have some self antigen and you're just deleting T cell receptors randomly, and you say, okay, well, I'm gonna, these are all the cells that pass positive selection, okay? So anything that doesn't recognize MHC at all gets deleted. Now of those that pass positive selection, you want to delete anything that, that um, can recognize self antigen, but you know, the, each T cell receptor is going to have a different affinity for an antigen. And so, you delete most of them, sorry. So you have, you have to set some cutoff here. So that's the negative selection threshold. Anything that recognizes self better than that gets deleted. So we've cut off everything from here, from positive selection and everything here from negative selection. Now, this is what you're left with are cells that have or very low reactivity against self antigens. And then you have some cells that actually have fairly moderate reactivity to self antigens, but because there wasn't really so much of that self antigen in the thymus, it's, it's okay. Then what happens is that those cells make it out of the thymus. And now those cells, if it's, if it's going to recognize something foreign, may have very high affinity for that foreign thing, but they also have the potential to react to a self antigen. And this, this sort of violates in many ways the clonal selection theory where we assume that a T cell receptor can only recognize one thing. In reality, that's not strictly true. T cell can recognize variants of the same peptide and still respond. So because of that, you have some self-reactive T cells in the periphery. It's not as bad as, as for B cells because there are these extra layers, but you do still have some. And so how do we maintain peripheral tolerance for T cells? Well, the first thing is if there's no innate uh, inflammatory signals, okay? If it's just a, a regular old cell that doesn't have, hasn't gotten any IL-12 or interferons to, to signal it that it should make a response, there's no PAMP receptor signaling, then it doesn't express costimular type of proteins like the B7 proteins, which are recognized by the CD28 co-stimulatory protein on T cells. So if it's just a regular cell or a non-activated antigen, antigen presenting cell, it doesn't have B7. And so there's no signal there for that T cell to get that co-stimulatory signal to keep going. On the other hand, if, it, if that antigen presenting cell has actually gotten a negative signal, in a non-inflammatory environment, it can engage things like CTLA-4 on a T cell, and that also prevents the T cell responding. So in, in both cases, this results in sort of an aberrant response. For CD4 T cells, 
it's mostly energy where you're preventing CD4 cells from responding, okay? And this is, <clears throat> this is uh, because CD4 T cells are controlling everything else, they are the most dangerous cells. So you shut them down um, initially just by, by uh, preventing them from responding. For CD8 T cells, excuse me, it's a little different. CD8 T cells will still make a response, but then they go undergo exhaustion where they, it's essentially the same thing as a primary foci B cell. Yes, you make a response, but there's no CD4 help there. So the CD8 T cells will go away. And that can be exhaustion, which is a term used to saying you made a response, but we now shut it off. And then, or you can generate regulatory cells, which will help shut that response off. Okay, so that's, that's a T cell intrinsic mechanism. The T cell to go undergo full activation to give you a, a good effective response that can be long lived requires co-stimulation. But just like for B cells, there are extrinsic ways, right? B cells can shut themselves off or the CD4 T cells can shut them off or lack of a CD4 response prevents the long lived B cell response. For T cells, you have this additional layer which are the regulatory T cells, okay? And they really come in two different varieties but they have the same job. Their job is to shut down self responses um, and, and sort of raise the bar to how much of a signal do you need to make a response. Now the natural Tregs, which are now, I think most of the time they're now being called thymic Tregs. There's two different terms for the same thing. The natural Tregs, which I'll, that's what I'll call them because um, that's what I was taught they were called. These develop from T cells in the thymus and they're actually a very high affinity for self antigen on self MHC. So instead of just deleting them, what happens is that they, they instead become regulatory cells and their job is to shut off any responses to self, okay? So these are T cells that when they come out of the thymus, they are already a regulatory T cell and they are ready to shut down any other responses. Induced Tregs are a little different. These are the result, a normal CD4 cell coming out of the thymus and it gets activated in the absence of inflammatory signals and often in the presence of things like uh, tumor growth factor beta. And so this is where you have a normal T cell, but it's not getting all the right signals during its activation and it then becomes a induced Treg, where, where, or now is being called a peripheral Treg. I don't like those terms because it makes it seem like thymic Tregs are working in thymus and peripheral Tregs are working to periphery, but whichever term you use is fine with me. Um, <clears throat> they have the same job though, right? From our T cell activation, we know that they upregulate FOXP3 and their job is to suppress other responses. So we'll just review that quickly. How do they do that? Well, one of the main thing is they make inhibitory cytokines like tumor growth factor beta, and that then works on other cells to shut them off, okay? They also can be killers of killers. So they can make granzyme A or B and kill other T cells, shutting off the response. They do other things. One of the more important ones is that they have these Tregs express high levels of the high affinity uh, IL-2 receptor. And so they basically sop up all the IL-2 and there's none left for the effector T cells, which then die off. Okay, so there's three main ways. Perhaps the most important way though, is that Tregs will shut off dendritic cells. So Treg can encounter a dendritic cell and basically be, it expresses inhibitory receptors that tell that dendritic cell, you can no longer activate T cells. Okay, so this is at least four mechanisms sort of presented in, in no, no order of, of importance where they're either making inhibitory cytokines, killing off other T cells, sopping up all the growth factor or turning off dendritic cells so they can't activate other cells. Okay, so,
we have different layers of tolerance. All of these work together. And so we sort of covered central tolerance, right? Where you have deletion or, or for B cells at least, editing of the B cell receptor to get a, another shot at being non-self-reactive. That's central tolerance, it's a first step. The second one is, that we often don't think about is that if there's no damage to your pancreas, then T cells will never, in, in, they don't just go to your pancreas because they, they're interested in it. They if they're going to make a response, they has to start in the lymph node. So T cells don't just randomly go to different organs looking for self antigen. So there's a physical barrier to access antigen. Okay, antigen has to actually get into the lymphatic system, otherwise you can't make a response to it. Now there, then there are other mechanisms like peripheral energy. This is where you get uh, antigen recognition of by B cells or T cells but there's no co-stimulatory signal. So the, for B cells, there's no complement proteins, there's no uh, T cell signal to the B cells. So you might make a, a response, but it actually will, will shut down. And for T cells, if the dendritic cells haven't been activated, they don't have co-stimulatory proteins. So the T cells will, will undergo this peripheral inactivation. Then you have regulatory cells. These are cells that are designed to shut down self responses. And so they're operating in both lymph nodes and at, at sites of inflammation to shut down autoimmune responses. And part of what they're doing is binding all the, the cytokines up, basically saying, okay, we're gonna inhibit. So the regulatory cells are re really doing mostly the cytokine uh, regulation. And then even if you make a response, right, for B cells or T cells, if there's no CD4 help, those both undergo clonal exhaustion or just you made a response, but we shut off all the cells and they die off and so they go away. For B cells, this is primarily the primary foci, which are short-lived plasma blasts, but if there's no CD4 help, they die off. For CD8 T cells, if you make a CD8 response with no CD4 help, that also undergoes exhaustion and those cells die. Okay, so you have many, many layers of tolerance that this idea of central tolerance is just the first step. You have to have all of these peripheral tolerance mechanisms to stop autoimmune responses. But they don't always work. As you know, there, many people have autoimmune diseases. Now for most of those, if you talk to somebody with an autoimmune disease, they've had it for 10, 15, 20 years. It's not something that develops overnight and is gonna kill you in a day. It takes many, many years for that pathology to really develop and, and is a problem long-term. <clears throat> and autoimmunity can attack any organ of the body. And here's just a few examples. It can be neurological, right? This is multi multiple sclerosis. Uh, there's Guillain-Barre syndrome. There are a number of immune diseases that actually affect uh, the brain pathology. It can be bones, right? Rheumatoid arthritis, can be muscle, can be muscular dystrophy is an autoimmune disease, can be skin, lungs, can be uh, your digestive tract, can be even the, in the blood, or specialized organs like the thyroid. One that's not on here is, you know, your your pancreas. That's if you have type one diabetes, that's an autoimmune um, response. So now the the pathology that you get from each of these different autoimmune responses is very different. Okay, and it can be due to there are a few examples of innate components. So people with problems in complement proteins or NK cells. Um, that leads to activation of innate pathways and that, that causes disease. Uh, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria is an innate, is an autoimmune disease that is primarily just from complement proteins getting activated and killing off uh, red blood cells. Okay, so this, this does happen, but most autoimmune diseases are either from antibodies against self tissues, and these can, they're, they're going to 
those antibodies will attack your cell tissues and they disrupt the function of those. So things like myasthenia gravis, where you have anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies, it's really blocking neural transmission. Okay, so it, it affects function of other cells. For T cells, most of the time, it's a slow killing of, of other self cells, and that also is going to impede the function of organs. And we'll go through some uh, examples of those. But one of the things that we'll keep coming back to, and particularly when we talk about allergies and other diseases, is that there is, has a, usually a trigger, right? There are genetic factors that make you more predisposed to autoimmunity, but there are many cases where identical twins with the same genetics, one will develop autoimmunity and one won't. And so that implies there is an infection or environmental trigger. So you have to have genetic factors that make you predisposed. You have to have some trigger, and then you have to fail these immune regulatory mechanisms. And that's only then can you develop autoimmunity. So what it, if we break these down, right? Excuse me. If you have, have to have those three things happening, well, where does that come from? Well, you can have uh, failures in thymic selection or other events that predispose you to having more self-reactive cells. So one of the things, for example, is uh, different MHC alleles are recognized more or less well and you have different expression levels of MHC proteins and that affects your ability to delete self-reactive cells. And so if you have those particular MHC, you're likely to develop more self-reactive cells. Now, the second part, okay, so you've got more, more self-reactive cells, but then you have to have some activation of those cells, okay? They're not just gonna spontaneously activate, and this is thought to be often accompanied by infections. And we'll talk about that in just a second. There has to be some event that triggers this. And for some autoimmune diseases, we do know what triggers are, others we don't. But even if those triggers happen, then you have to have these peripheral tolerance mechanisms failing, okay? And this can also be influenced by genetic differences. So if you have a predisposition, uh, predisposition to making more IL-17, for example, you're more likely to get rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, so it's, it is the production of, of pro-response cytokines. It is um, failure of peripheral tolerance mechanisms. And so you really have to have all of these things happening. You have to have a self-reactive cells, have to be activated, and you have to fail preference tolerance mechanisms and indeed also that for a sustained autoreactive response, you need T cell help. So here, here are three of the more severe autoimmune diseases. People with these um, diseases typically don't last first, past the first year of life. <clears throat> so the first is autoimmune polyglandular syndrome type one or APS. In patients that have a defect in the, the air gene, remember this is the master transcription factor in, in medullary thymic epithelial cells that turns on all the genes. So you have self antigens in thymus and they get delete self reactive T cells. If you don't have that, T cells are not taller or not self reactive T cells are not deleted in the thymus. So you have many more cells that are escaping. We go back one slide, those patients would fall here right? They have many more self-reactive cells. On the other hand, in IPEX, which is a deficiency in FOXP3, you're failing peripheral tolerance mechanisms, okay? So FOXP3 is a transcription factor that is important for development of Tregs. If you don't have this, you don't develop Tregs, and so you can't, you fail peripheral tolerance mechanisms. So you have sort of this problem here, right? The last one is actually a failure of shutting down a response that's already happened. So autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome or ALPS is when you lack these death proteins that we talked about, FAS or FAS ligand, 
and you make a response, but the response doesn't go away. So you make a primary foci B cell response, but it doesn't die off. You make a CD8 response, but it doesn't die off. So it sort of overrides that the CD4 help problem and allows cells to survive even if there's, there's uh, no CD4 help for them, okay? So different mechanisms can lead to autoimmunity, either too many self-antigens, failure of peripheral tolerance, or failure to shut off responses that happen. But it can be more subtle, okay? So there, on the left are a number of autoimmune diseases, and I don't expect you to memorize what these are or memorize which HLA allele um, is associated with it. But there are other genes that are associated with susceptibility to autoimmune disease. Now, I put on the top here, for all you lefties in the, in the class, you have about uh, three times more chance or, or three times more likely to develop autoimmunity to right-handed people. We'd have no idea why, but that's what happens, okay? So, um, so there is some biases that we cannot explain. But HLA uh, associations, I think we can explain. So people with HLA B27, right? So you have HLA A, B, and C. If you have B27, you're more likely to develop these two autoimmune diseases, ankylosing spondylitis or acute anterior uveitis. If you have those, uh, that HLA allele, you're between 10 and 100 times more likely than somebody without it to develop autoimmunity. It's also, if you are male and have B27, HLA B27, then um, you're more likely to develop autoimmunity, okay? Now, on the other hand, so this is a MHC1. If you have MHC2, you're, you're either DR, HLA DR2 or HLA DR3, that you have a much greater risk of developing other autoimmune diseases. And in those cases, women are more pre predisposed than men. And so between, uh, between three and 20 times more likely to develop MS if you have HLA-DR2. But why is that? Well, in those diseases, for the top two, those are CD8 mediated. And B27 is more likely to present that self antigen that can be recognized. So it's just a, a chance of, are you gonna get the epitope on the surface? For uh, HLA DR2 or three, they're more likely to present, your, T, your antigen presenting cells are more likely to present self antigens on those MHC, and therefore you develop autoimmunity. Okay, so HLA associated risks are just your chances of presenting a self peptide that can be recognized by T cells. And this is sort of shown here that it can either be that um, your MHC, there's two ways to think about it. One, if it's really good at presenting that self antigen, it's more likely to delete self reactive T cells. On the other hand, if it's really good at presenting that antigen, it may only present this in the periphery, so you only get a response in those individuals. Now, that really means that if you have, uh, so th this is an example of the first one, if you have really good presentation, then you're gonna be more likely to delete everything, right? This is central tolerance. If you have less presentation, you don't delete those cells, they make it out of the thymus, and now you have some uh, threshold for a response, you can see you have all of these cells that are able to, to respond to that self antigen. So the question is, what's the trigger then? So this is the predisposition part of it. But what's the trigger part of it? Well, there's a number of ideas and the, the two main ones are molecular mimicry and epitope spreading. And they're very much related. Okay, so in molecular mimicry, you get an infection, say it's a virus, the T cells make a response to this and that's all everything that you want. But unfortunately, you have some self antigen that looks a whole lot like the virus. Okay, so in this case, here's our, 
Here's our virus. It's on, should be, this should say antigen presenting cell, not macrophage. It activates a Th1 cell or a, a T cell to become a Th1 cell. It then, then goes out and also recognizes a self peptide, which it just thinks is again, the viral peptide because it's now you've got memory cells. It makes a second response. On the other hand, epitope spreading is a little different. Okay, so again, we have some uh, virus or an infectious agent, it activates the T cells. Those then go out to the periphery and they start doing their job. And one of the things that their job is to kill uh, infected cells. And as those infected cells are being killed here, their, their parts are being taken up by antigen presenting cells and they can present antigens from killed cells and they activate other um, T cells. So instead of, it's, you can start to think of the first one is cross reactivity. It's, it looks just like the virus. And the second one, due to the damage from the immune system, the antigens from, or self antigens are being taken up by antigen presenting cells and activating other T cells. So it's not the first ones that cause the problem, it's the second one. Now some older ideas are that this is due to bystander activation, where you have normal, you have a viral infection, you have that T cells being activated, and then there's a T cell standing next to it that also gets those cytokine signals. This doesn't really work. We now know that this is mostly wrong. T cells have too many layers of, of recognition built in that you don't just have uh, bystander activation. So it's very unlikely that's true. Now, the last one is sort of a variation of epitope spreading. It's sort of the idea that um, you have a T cell being activated during an infection. So you, they all start the same way, goes out in the periphery, and then it's um, causing damage and you recruit uh, T cells to that site that then are, are recognizing antigen and killing off other cells. Are they being, act, excuse me, activated? This is, is a different version of epitope spreading where it's just sort of um, access to the site rather than the damage to the site. And it really, this is, is not the way that T cells work. We all know that they have to start in a lymph node, <clears throat> but in some cases of chronic infections and other things, sort of generate de novo lymph nodes in, in chronic infection sites or tumors. So this can happen, but I really want you to focus on A and B, epitope spreading and molecular mimicry, because those are the two main ways that this gets started. So what's the difference here, right? Uh, epitope spreading is you have um, a microbe activates a DC, okay, you activate a T cell. Those T cells go out and they cause tissue damage. And then you activate a second series of T cells. Molecular mimicry is just cross reactivity. So you have some peptide from a microbe. The T cell sees that peptide and one that's derived from your self protein as the same thing. And so you start causing damage to your self tissues. One of the things that may not be clear here is that these can both happen in the same thing. If there's molecular mimicry, then you'll start killing off self tissues, releasing those antigens, and you can get epitope spreading. So they both can happen. And there's many examples of this happening. So what are the diseases that cause different, um, different autoimmune problems? Okay, so we know a number of these. Uh, Coxsackie virus has been linked to a number of different autoimmune diseases, including uh, type 1 diabetes or cardiac, my uh, cardiac myopathy. So you can find epitopes from Coxsackie B virus that look just like host antigens. So that if, if you have the right MHC to present a pro-insulin uh, peptide, and then also presents a Coxsackie B epitope, then you're getting molecular mimicry. Okay, so this is, there are a number of examples where this has been shown to have sort of a, a correlative effect. And it can be either um, 
can be bacteria, streptococcus, can be viruses, there are some fungal infections, but it, there are a lot of different things that, that can trigger the immune system to, um, to have this molecular mimicry uh, start to autoimmunity. So here's one, this is HSV, herpes simplex virus one associated ocular keratitis, right? And so you get, you have an HSV one infection, you get those T cells against the virus, that's all what you want, but these will cross react to a corneal antigen. And you can see that, that essentially you can't dilate your eye or you can't undilate your eye. Okay, so that's, clear case of it looks to, it's the same antigen. Now, again, this is where the MHC alleles predispose you. You have to have an MHC allele that presents both the viral peptide and your self peptide. <clears throat> There's also a rheumatic fever that's associated with streptococcus, okay? And so in the top, it's, it's a T cell mediated disease where the epitope looks the same on to T cells. But you can have this for B cells too, where you have a streptococcal infection, you make streptococcal specific antibodies, okay? And because of that, it's a normal infection, you get long-lived plasma cells and, and uh, memory B cells. But these antibodies will actually bind to cardiac tissue, primarily on the, on the heart. <clears throat> and that look similar to the, the M protein from streptococcus, and then those antibodies get the, recruit complement proteins and um, other cells, innate cells, that will start killing off that cardiac tissue. Eventually, that leads to loss of function in the heart, and you die from, from cardiac arrest. Epitope spreading also happens, and this is where, um, where you get an initial response to an infection, but then damage at the site leads to additional responses to self antigens. So in Coxsackie B virus, you have infection and the virus specific T cells go off and they kill pancreatic cells that are infected with the virus. Then what happens is those antigens are being released. They're being taken up by dendritic cells and then go to a lymph node and boom, you have naive T cells against self antigens being activated. Those cells then go back to the pancreas and they start killing off um, all of your pancreatic cells, including the beta islet cells that are producing uh, insulin. There are some uh, sort of more severe diseases, but it can also be antibody mediated, right? So, so in the top is T cells, and the bottom is pemph uh, pemphigus vulgaris. This is a disease where you make antibodies to um, these proteins that are at cell junctions, particularly in mucosal sites, but can also be in the dermis. And so you get antibodies to self antigen and those sort of increase the amount of inflammation. But now those antigens are being released in that inflammatory environment and new B cells against those released antigens are being generated or activated. And now you're making skin specific antibodies. Again, those antibodies will bind to your skin cells or epithelial cells, and you get complement activation, formation of the membrane attack complex. Eosinophils are coming and neutrophils are gonna come in and they start destroying all of those cells that have self antibodies on them. So some of the other things, things get, can start in fact, uh, autoimmunity are not always infections. And so, there was a drug called pronestyl, right? And this was a drug that um, was designed to gently kill your heart. Essentially, it was to impede cardiac function in people with arrhythmia to try and normalize their heartbeat. And so what happened is that it would come in, it would kill off some of the cardiac cells, cardiac tissue, and then you would essentially release those cell contents and because of that, then you get a new response against, you get a new T cell and B cell response against cardiac tissue. And that gives you a much worse um, disease. In reality, this caused a very lupus-like syndrome where you get lots of self-reactive antibodies. And we'll, we'll sort of cover lupus in a second because it's, lupus is not just one disease anymore. It's a whole constellation of diseases. <clears throat> 
there are other sort of case uh, people are saying, well, it's, it's drugs, it's not, it doesn't happen in nature. It can happen from natural products. So this was a case in Spain in the early 80s where there was some contaminant in a, a, a batch of olive oil and it caused essentially uh, eosinophilia, high IgE, essentially like as if you had a, a massive allergy response in the lung and that results in lung necrosis. And then again, you have epitope spreading, the damaged lung tissue is releasing antigens that then are being picked up by dendritic cells and initiating new T cell responses. So you're getting a trigger and then a long-term autoimmune response. Now, unfortunately, um, women have a much higher incidence of autoimmunity than men. And I, in this class, I don't use gender terms strictly. So female um, individuals have higher incidence of many autoimmune diseases than men do or males do. And the hypothesis for this is that there are the more complex hormonal control regulates gene expression. And so you get uh, many more cryptic antigens after sexual maturation that are not present earlier. And so there's a higher chance of, of uh, these things happening. So if you look at some of these like lupus, it's a huge uh, incidence difference between male and female individuals. There's a few ulcer, ulcerative colitis and diabetes that men have a higher incidence for. And it's not clear why, and those may be behavioral or, or genetic. <clears throat> but in general, if you're left-handed female and have the wrong MHC, you have a very high chance of developing autoimmune diseases. Okay, so when we break these down, we often talk about tissue specific versus systemic. And the ones that I've talked about uh, previously have been mostly tissue specific. So if you have something that's attacking one tissue, it's limited just to that one area. Well, there can be other things like if it's attacking uh, joints. Well, that's lots of different joints. Uh, if it's attacking um, self antigens in lupus-like diseases, then it can be widespread throughout the body, particularly if it's an autoimmune disease against uh, cells of the immune system, which can happen, okay? So in general, we break these down and no, you don't have to memorize which are which. I'm just want you to really uh, key into the idea that if it's a response against one cell type that's limited in where it is, then it's just gonna be as organ specific. So here's some examples of that. And they can be, there, there's, I'm gonna present two different versions of the same disease, okay? In Hashimoto's thyroiditis, you get thyroid specific antibodies. And this against a, a thyroid stimulating hormone or thyroglobulin. And what they do are they're binding these and, and cause complement mediated lysis of thyroid cells. So you get hypothyroidism where not enough thyroid is, uh, hormones are being made. And so when that happens, then those things are, the antigens from those cells are being released and now you generate more T cell responses. And so thing, generally this happens is that you progress to worse and worse disease. And you can see this, this huge amount of swelling beneath the neck is due to that inflammatory environment. For people with, like, with that disease, you have to have hormone replacement therapy for life because you destroyed the cells making the hormones. Now the flip side of that is Graves' disease. Graves' disease, um, Patients with Graves' disease have this bulging behind their eyes that makes their eyes seem like they're coming out of their head. So if you've ever encountered somebody like that, it's actually a very um, stark phenotype. And in this case, you're actually getting antibodies against the thyroid stimulating hormone receptor, and they're activating. Okay, so they're they're um, they're causing the thyroid cells to make more hormones. This is a form of hyperthyroidism. In this case, you actually get antibodies, you get uh, tissue damage behind the eyes, among, among other places, and that, those, that scar tissue is actually pushing the eyeballs forward, sort of out of the socket. <clears throat> okay, and that, that also is treated by reducing thyroid 
Now, systemic things can be uh, either nerval, nerve associated or muscle associated. So, they, so things like myasthenia gravis, okay? These are where you have acetylcholine receptor specific antibodies and it's gonna block neural transmission between your neurons and your muscles. And so people with this often will have sort of localized paralysis of their muscles. And you can see that in this patient is in the left side of his face and that prevents the muscles from working. So you just, you don't have, um, you don't have control of them. Okay, so these are just antibodies that are blocking neurotransmitters. If you have antibodies that are targeting joints, right? We probably all know somebody with arthritis. This is a severe case, but essentially the antibodies are just going to be against the synovial joint antigens and you get constant complement activation and eight cell destruction and that, that um, destroys the, the cartilage and the joints themselves and resulting in loss of limb function. It can be, it's often seen in the, in the extremities and the hands and feet, but it can be in, in other joints as well. So in Arizona, we often see patients with lupus. And one of the reasons for that is because in areas of high sunlight, patients are more likely to develop what's called a the lupus rash. And so this is often seen on the face, right, as a sort of uh, almost a mask or some kind of badge over the nose and into the cheeks of bright red um, inflammatory response. And it's not clear why, but it's, it's probably sunlight damage that's sort of aggravating uh, lupus responses in those areas. But in lupus, it's essentially uh, a now is grouped together as a constellation of diseases. And what happens is that you're making um, T cell and B cell responses against self things. Classically, lupus is when you have cell damage. Again, an example of epitope shredding. You have da cell damage and that then results in release of things like um, DNA or um, particularly as DNA bound to nucleosomes. And so then you get activation of nucleosome specific B cells. If that's taken up by a dendritic cell, then you also get activation of, of nucleosome specific T cells. And that then provides the signal, yes, yeah, you should make a response. Okay, so this is again, epitope spreading. It doesn't necessarily have to be against DNA and nucleosomes though. It can be against you know, almost any serum protein. This happens for many other um, lupus-like diseases. You're getting sort of broad, widespread um, antibody and T cell responses to self antigens. Now what happens in lupus is eventually those antibodies, particularly in peripheral sites will deposit and then you get further inflammation and loss of, of organ function. It can be in the fingers, it can be in your central organs, right? And so any of those essentially is causing organ specific uh, or organ, organ function loss and eventually uh, result in lethal disease. So what do we do about it, right? You probably, if you've been self-isolating for the past however many months now, eight months-ish, uh, daytime TV is filled with, with anti-autoimmunity commercials. And you've probably seen them and, and not known that what you're looking at is, is really hardcore immunology. So there's some of the original treatments for autoimmune diseases were just immune suppression, right? I would say before 2000, that was really your only option, okay? And so what would you do? Well, you would take corticosteroids, cyclosporin, serolimus. These are all things that will block T cell function. If you block the T cells, you can block the antibodies and the, and the particularly if you're blocking CD4 cells, you block antibody production, you block CD8 responses. And so that, that can shut down a response. Okay, so what do they do? Well, they all are shut, blocking the effector cells. This can improve symptoms, but ultimately the problem is that, that you're immune suppressed. These are fairly uh, high level immune suppression. 
So you, now you become susceptible to infections. So it's not an ideal solution. So the steroids, corticosteroids, of which one is dexamethasone, is mainly blocking um, production of IL-2. And the way that it does that is it's shutting off uh, transcription of, of IL-2 genes. And so you don't have the T cell growth factor that allows your T cells to expand. And so you're just shutting it off at the beginning. Um, and steroids are often membrane permeable. So they're good to deliver and they can get right into a, a T cell and shut it down. For patients that have very severe coronavirus infections, this is the treatment because most of the disease that you see with coronavirus is immune mediated. It's T cell mediated, shut off the T cells and then the patients start to recover. Some of the other ones like cyclosporin, right, is going to block calcium release inside the cell. If you don't have calcium release, you don't get nuclear factor of activation in T cells activated and you also are blocking IL-2, okay? So cyclosporin is gonna block here. You can tell this is a British version because it's cyclosporin. Finally, the serolimus is, is actually working on a different pathway. It's working on a molecular target of rapamycin, which is a key regulator of, of, of your uh, metabolism in cells. T cells have to, or they're obligate glucose users when they're expanding, have to use glucose and mTOR regulates that. If you block mTOR, they can't use glucose for cell cycle progression and so they don't, they can't divide. But the problem with these is they're just globally suppressing immune responses and so it's not a great long-term solution because you ultimately become susceptible to infection. The modern version of this is to use antibodies against some of the key cytokines or cells that are important for some of these um, some of these autoimmune diseases. One of the main ones that you see quite a bit, particularly for um, arthritis, among other things, is anti-TNF. TNF is this very uh, very dangerous molecule that your T cells will produce, and if you have um, some of these autoimmune diseases like arthritis or lupus, this is what's causing you to have continued responses. Okay, so blocking TNF will stop the inflammatory signals that are just telling these cells to keep going on. There are a number of other ones, but one that's come up recently is anti-IL-17, which is not a cytokine that we pay a lot of attention to, but it turns out to be really important for sort of these long-term uh, responses, particularly to um, epithelial antigens. And so you see patients that have eczema or dermatitis, chronic dermatitis, get prescribed things like anti-IL-17, and that stops inflammatory responses there. So you can block the cytokines. The other thing that you can use are antibodies against cell surface proteins. So one of them, there's two here that I've I've got here. Uh, Abatercept is an anti-CD28 antibody, and it's designed to both block CD4 um, activation, as well as uh, cause complement mediated lysis of those cells. So you're really shutting them down and, um, and, sh and killing them off. On the other hand, if you have an antibody mediated autoimmune disease like lupus or something, something like that, then you can use an antibody against a B cell antigen, something the B cells expressing. This is, is anti-CD20. This is actually used in some myeloma, myelomas and leukemias, B cell myelomas and B cell leukemias to deplete all of your B cells, okay? If you do that, then you don't, you, you stop the B cells from making long-lived plasma cells, and then you don't have continued autoantibodies. And all of these treatments are fairly new, right? Within the last 10 years, these have been really developed, and IL-17 was certainly one of the newer ones, but they're designed to stop the inflammation, to intervene at some point. Okay, so what do I want you to know about autoimmunity? 
why I think you should be able to differentiate epitope spreading from molecular mimicry. Those are the two main mechanisms that lead to autoimmunity. You should also understand if it's a B cell, uh, a B cell mediated autoimmune disease, what prevents that? What are the layers of tolerance for B cells? There's central, uh, central tolerance, excuse me. There is peripheral tolerance where you, uh, B cells become energic and they can't respond. And then there's sort of, well, if they make a response but there's no CD4 help, then it goes away. So it's not a problem. For T cells, know those same kinds of things. What are the layers for T cells um, to do the layers of tolerance for T cells? Central tolerance, peripheral tolerance, and then sort of the shutdown of a response if there's no CD4 help. You don't have to know specifically which diseases are caused by which things. Okay, and again, the test will be open notes, so you wouldn't be hard to say which, which of those diseases are B cell or T cell mediated. And with that, I'll stop a few minutes early and take questions. Dr. Blattman? Yes. I have a question about, um, my little sister has Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, mm -hmm. but I don't. And if you're, if you were saying that it's like a combination of a genetic and an environmental factor, could I also have like the genetic component for it, but I just never had that environmental trigger? It could be, and it could also be that you don't have the same genetic component. Mm -hmm. right? If it's HLA associated, you don't necessarily have the same HLA alleles as your sister, mm -hmm. right? Because you're getting three from each parent and, or you know, three class one and three class two from each parent. And those don't always segregate together. Mm -hmm. so, so the HLA that determines the MHC protein? Correct. There are other she associations, but that's one of them. Mm -hmm. But there's no, I, I don't know if you've ever done HLA typing, but you, there's no, Mm -hmm. don't necessarily have the same MHC as your, as your siblings. She also has celiac disease and there, there's some sort of correlation between the two and I don't know what it is, but I, I know that there is one. Yeah, we often see patients with one autoimmune disease have other autoimmune diseases. And part of the problem or part of the reason for that is that this idea of epitope shredding, if you're constantly damaging tissues Mm -hmm. Patients with rheumatoid arthritis or with uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, you're constantly damaging tissues and so you get epitope spreading and you get other autoimmune diseases. Is there, which one would have come first if it were epitope spreading? There's no way of knowing that. Uh huh. So it could have been the thyroid antibodies that trigger some sort of... It, could, sort be. Of it could be the response fact that... In the small intestine. If she has hypothyroidism, then other things get impacted and then you know, tissue damage at other sites that are not necessarily immune, it's more hormonal regulated. Huh. So there's, there's lots of reasons that it can uh, keep spreading to other autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. Would it, could it possibly lead to another one? Is, the, is there like a, an additional disease that's associated with those two? I don't know a specific one, but yeah, it could lead to other autoimmune disorders. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Blattman? Yes. Um, so for epitope spreading, it's basically when the T cells are killing the pathogen and it keeps killing the same cells that are, I'm, I'm kind of confused about like the difference between molecular mimicry and the epitope spreading. So molecular mimicry, it's T cell got activated against a pathogen antigen and it recognizes self antigen that looks just like it. Okay, so it, this is like, okay, they were originally started against something else, but now they just keep going against something that looks like what they got started against. Epitope spreading is a little different. They're started against one thing, okay, so they're starting against an infection, but as there's tissue damage and release of other proteins that have no, no resemblance to the original thing, those can taken up and presented on and antigen presenting cells. And so you get a, a second set of T cells recognizing self antigens. They're not, they're not 
reacting to, they're not cross-reactive to the first antigen, they're reacting to new antigens. But how are, why are they reacting to those antigens? Because in, in chronic inflammatory situations or, or some, we, we make this seem like a clean thing and apoptosis is generally a, is a generally an ordered process, but in any situation where you have inflammation, you can have tissue damage. For example, um, if you have a burn, right? You get, you get necrotic tissue damage. And so those antigens are released. There's an inflammatory environment there. So dendritic cells are saying, getting a signal, yes, there's something going on here. They're picking up antigens from these dead or dying cells and presenting them just like they would present anything else. So they're, you're, they're presenting it just as if they were picking up microbes from their environment. Oh, I see. Okay. Thank you. So there's a question about uh, medical marijuana for the treatment of of arthritis. I don't know that there's any literature on the immunology part of that. It's mostly probably symptomology where you're alleviating the pain, um, right? Because arthritis is quite painful all, all the time. And so it's a probably treating the symptoms rather than, than affecting the immune system. But there's certainly a lot of research that's still going on in that area. Okay, there's no more questions. We'll see you on Thursday.